Hi all, RetroTech Chris here again. Recently, I learned about this idea where we can turn a Pi Zero wireless into a USB memory stick. So I decided to give it a try. And today, I'm going to take you through the procedure on how you too can create your very own USB Wi-Fi memory stick. Let's have a look. So first of all, this procedure along with all of my other retro procedures are available in my GitHub repository. And there will be a link to this procedure in the description below. I think it's important before we get too far along that we talk about some of the limitations of this setup. So first of all, this really is a GWiz concept. It does have some practical applications though. Perhaps the biggest limitation of this device is that if you copy files to the partition, either via the network or directly on the Pi, they won't show up on the USB side of things until you either restart the device or basically reload the driver. So for the second limitation, maybe I'm not being completely fair, but I did find this setup a little bit flaky. There were cases where basically on startup, we'd see unrecognized USB device on Windows 10 and cases where copying data wasn't always consistent. So these are things to consider, but this can still be a fun experiment. So despite the limitations, there is some good news. Any files that you copy to the USB device, say on your retro computer, will show up on the network right away. Let's talk about the hardware needed for this experiment. First of all, you need a Raspberry Pi 0W. The next thing you'll need is a Raspberry Pi W USB-A add-on board. And the nice thing about this board is it doesn't require that you have headers on the Raspberry Pi Zero W. It connects right up. And also, several sellers will include a nice acrylic case. And finally, you're going to need a micro SD card. And I found that small capacity is fine, especially when dealing with DOS images. If you wanted to share files with a FAT32 or maybe an NTFS system, you could certainly get a larger card. So the next thing we're going to do is use the Raspberry Pi Imager to install Raspberry Pi OS Lite onto the SD card. The first thing you need to do is download it. So we'll go ahead and navigate to the website and download it. You can just search for Raspberry Pi Imager in Google and you'll see it pops right up as the first search result. You can scroll down and click on download for Windows since we're using a Windows based approach for this particular tutorial. With the imager downloaded and installed, the first thing we're going to do is erase the card. So it's a little strange, but we choose erase for operating system and then choose the card itself and write. And this will erase the card for us and prepare it for OS installation. And when you do that, you'll get some pop-ups in Windows. As you see here, you can just click through them and close that and you'll be all set. So with that, we can click continue. And then from there, we can proceed to install the operating system onto the SD card. So I'm going to actually choose Raspberry Pi Other, and then we're going to choose the light version of Raspberry Pi OS because we don't need a full installation for this. And then from there, we want to click on the settings wheel so that we can do some customization so that this image will basically pre-install and pre-set up all of our settings. I'm setting our host name to USB Pi and enabling SSH so that we can access the device to configure it more a little bit later. From there, we'll set a username and password. Pi is fine, and then a password to a company. And from there, we're going to configure our wireless LAN. And what's nice is that the settings get pre-populated for you. That's pretty cool. And then from there, I'm gonna change the wireless LAN country. I don't suggest using the dropdown here. Just type it in. There's too many items and it gets to be a real pain. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then from there, we can set the locale though. To be honest with you, I don't think this really matters. And then finally, we can click save to save these settings. Next up, we're going to choose storage like we did when we erased and choose our SD card. And from there, we can write the OS. And this process takes somewhere around five to six minutes. I have sped it up here considerably to save your time, but it will take five or six minutes to write that operating system out. And after that, you'll get a variety of pop-ups again. Just close them. You don't really need them for now. So 
So the next thing we get to do is edit one file because what we're going to do is create a separate data partition. And the first thing the installer does is actually resize your partition on the device to the maximum size. But by taking this configuration option out that you see here, that resize won't happen and we'll have space to be able to create a partition a little bit later on. So I've just cut that out and I'll save this file and from there we'll be all set. Perfect. So with that, it's time to pop the card into the Raspberry Pi and power it on. And after a few minutes, it will go through its setup procedure and will be accessible via SSH. I'm kind of impatient, so I tried it out here pretty quick and you'll see it fails. So you're certainly welcome to try it a few times as well. I would say give it a good five minutes and that Raspberry Pi should be all set up and ready for SSH for you. And I did SSH to USB Pi since that's what we named the device. And we're going to log in as Pi. I'll get the password wrong once, but then we'll be logged in. Great. So the next thing we're going to do is work with the disk partitions. We're actually going to grow that main partition and then create a partition so that we have a place to store our data. So I'm going to launch the FDisk program and we're going to have a look at the existing partition table. And the first thing we're going to do is note the start sector of partition two. And you can see I've highlighted it there. Now we're going to delete it. I know this sounds strange, but trust me, it will be fine. That's just the way it works in Linux. From there, we can create a new partition. So we'll go ahead and hit P to do that, and then two to select partition two. And then from there, we can choose that start sector from above. And then we're going to say plus four G to give ourselves a four gigabyte partition. And before long, it will be all created. So from there, we can hit Y to accept that we're removing the signature. And then from there, we can hit P to verify our partition is in place. And that looks pretty good. So from there, we'll just hit W to write it and we'll have a new partition two on the disk. So the next thing we'll do is make the kernel aware of the bigger image, and then we can resize it to be the full four gigabytes or 3.7 gigabytes, it looks like. Now we're going to create another partition, technically the third partition on the disk. So once again, we're gonna load FDisk up and we can go ahead and print the partition information. And we want to note the end sector of partition two. From there, we can create a primary partition and we're going to make it say 500 megabytes because I'm going to be using this under MS-DOS. Now the key thing here is when you create that new partition, you wanna add one to the end partition of the previous partition. I don't quite have that highlighted here in the notes, I apologize, but that's what we want to do. I'll fix the procedure before I upload it. And then from there, we're gonna make it 500 megabytes and then we can basically confirm it by pressing P once again. And we can see it looks like we have a 477 megabyte partition there. So next we can just hit W2 right. And the next thing I'm going to do is format this as XFAT. It doesn't have to be XFAT. It can be whatever partition scheme you want. Again, this is going to mount on the host system with this partition. And now I'm going to add this to the partition table so that we can do things like mount it as a network share. So we'll copy this line in and we'll be all set. And by the way, to exit nano, it is a control X, a Y, and then an enter. I'll update the procedure to make that more explicit. So next up, we can actually configure the device to support USB mass storage sharing. So back in nano again, we need to edit boot config.txt to add this DT overlay parameter at the bottom under the all section as you see me doing. And then once again, it's control X, Y, and enter to exit nano. And then from there, we need to modify Etsy RC local or some other startup script so that this runs on startup. Be sure to add this line above the exit zero line or it will not execute. And once again, to get out, it's control X, then Y, then enter. At this point, we're going to reboot the Raspberry Pi with a pseudo reboot. Sometime later, the reboot will complete and a device will pop up. Look, we have a drive G. Let's have a closer look at it. And as we look at the properties of this, we will see something. It is an XFAT drive that is about 475 megabytes. So at this point, we wanna go ahead and SSH into the Raspberry Pi so that we can configure Samba, or maybe you have another network share of choice, maybe it's NFS. But in any event, I'm gonna demonstrate this with Samba 
we will configure Samba so that we can copy files to this device over the network. So the first thing we're going to do is an apt-get update and then an apt-get install for Samba. And this will take some time, especially on a Pi Zero. I've already done this, so the output you see on my side will be less than what you see on your side. But before long, it will complete. Get a cup of coffee, come back, and you'll be all set. So next, we're going to edit the Samba configuration. The first couple of settings are optional. These global settings that we're going to add, it basically allows you to share the Samba share with, say, a MSLAN client network. So not required, but it will allow that if desired. You can omit it otherwise if you're going to be copying from a modern PC. And then we're going to add one share called data at the bottom so that we can access the partition on this Raspberry Pi to copy files to it. So there you have it. Once again, when it's done, it's a control X, Y, then enter to get out of nano. And we'll copy all these items to the left here and we'll be all set. Okay. So at this point, we can now use the device. I'm going to do a demonstration. First, we're going to add a file to the USB device, and we'll go ahead and just say this is a test, something like that, a hello file. If we come over to the network share, we will see that the file is there on a refresh. Great. The next thing we're going to do is create a file on the network share to show a limitation of the device. So we'll just call this another test from the network. It's going to fail. So we'll get that all typed in and create the file. I'll fix all of my casing and we can save this off. And then from there, I'll show you on the Raspberry Pi that we can actually see this file right now. If we go to the mounted share and lo and behold, it is there. So that's good. So now let's go to the actual USB stick and refresh and it's not available. So as we can see, that's a limitation of the device. But what we can do is reboot the Raspberry Pi and that file will appear. So let's demonstrate that. So after reboot, you will see the file is available on the USB stick. So that's good. It's just a limitation to be aware of. So one particular great application of this, of course, is use in a retro computer. And this device is particularly useful if you want to copy files from that retro machine back to the network, or if you don't mind doing a reboot, also copying files from the network to the retro machine. I hope that you enjoyed the demonstration of this USB Wi-Fi stick. And if you decide to try this yourself, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear about it. But in all cases, that's what I had for you today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.